Hey folks, Zach Osterman here, IU Insider, Indianapolis Star. It is, what is today, Tuesday, October 8th, 2024. He is Mike Nislick from the Bloomington Herald Times, as I pointed him through my computer camera. Uh, Mike, uh, I think we said we'd do this last week and we wound up uh, punting it to this week, but we're going to sort of pause on football. It's obviously the bye week. Uh, we did a, a fair bit post game around IU Northwestern. I'm sure there will be more to talk about as we build up toward next week's visit from Nebraska, probably one of the biggest home games Indiana's had in quite a while, certainly in the Big Ten. Um, but you and I were both at men's and women's basketball media days in Rosemont, Illinois, out near O'Hare last week. Um, and, you know, while these these events have kind of changed in nature over the years, there is still some some interesting, some compelling stuff that, that tends to come out of them. And, and I just, I guess, first of all, your your overall impressions of, you know, did you learn anything new from Indiana, either on the women's side or the men's side? Obviously, IU had its own media days uh, last month. Did anything, you know, did, did anything feel different this time around for you? Well, I think I just felt like Mike Woodson uh, really likes his team. Um, you know, he was in a – good spirits and um you know uh, I, I just felt like he had a lot of confidence you know last year i feel like he was kind of you know every, every time he talked about his team before the season he was sort of pumping the brakes and, and be like look we got a lot of new faces i don't know how it's all going to come together um you know it's going to be a kind of a challenge and a lot of the same things apply to this team. I mean, they've got a lot of new faces. They got, you know, seven new scholar, I think seven, seven new scholarship players. Um, and the, you know, there's no talk about that. I mean, some of the specific questions, like what's the offense going to exactly look like? He's like, I don't know yet, but um, he's not sort of trying to hedge his bets or say, you know, this team's not, you know, he wants this team to come out with a really fast start, you know, and be really sharp at the start. And I, I thought that was kind of in direct opposition to, how he talked about uh, last year's team and sort of, uh, you know, managing expectations a little bit. And he's, and he's not doing that this year. So last week um, around the, uh, and, and this is something that's happened for a while, Adam Jardy from the Columbus Dispatch asked me to sort of tag in as, as uh, sort of co, uh, I guess, aggregator or surveyor this year. But for years, the Big Ten media have put together an unofficial preseason poll, basically ever since the Big Ten conference stopped asking media voters to rank in order and finish. Um, in that poll, Indiana was picked to finish uh, second behind Purdue. Uh, Indiana was the only uh, beyond Purdue. Twenty voters out of I think we I think we wound up with we try to get two for each, um, basically press core in the Big Ten. So two two reporters covering each team. I want to say we landed at 33 or 34 this year. We had a couple, we had a little trouble finding some, pinning some people down on the West coast, some people who kind of, you know, sort of said, Hey, I don't feel like I know the league well enough, that kind of thing. Um, but we still had close to a full voting compliment. Purdue got 21st first, first place votes. Indiana was the only other big 10 school that got more than two. Indiana got seven first place votes. Indiana uh, had Umar Balo get uh, a couple votes for preseason player of the year. Indiana had uh, Indiana saw Ballo win uh, pretty comfortably preseason transfer of the year. Miles Rice also uh, was among the leading vote getters among sort of also rans in that group. Ballo landed first team All Big Ten, and if you look at the um, in, in, we do two All Big Ten teams, and if you look at team players also receiving votes, um, three of the top four players in terms of players that also received votes for one of those two. Uh, all Big Ten teams were Malik Renu, McKenzie, and Baco Miles Rice. My point here is you talk about Mike Woodson really liking what he has, seeming to like anyway, what he has in this team. Um, it really does feel like there's a chance, and we don't know exactly how it all gets to put, put together. You reference the fact that Woodson himself isn't quite sure how it all puts, you know, sort of fits together. I do think there is a chance, though, that this is the um, – this is the most rawly talented roster in the league. I mean, I, I thought about this. I kind of broke it down in my mind this way. Um, 
if you look at Indiana's, you know, if we assume Kane and Carlisle is the starting two guard right now because Trey Galloway is still getting healthy, um, are there five players better at any of those five positions in the Big Ten than any of the five players Indiana is going to start? Miles Rice, Kane and Carlisle, and Mackenzie and Baco, Malik Renew, Umar Bala. I think you've probably got a top five player at least at every one of those positions if you're Indiana. And that's a that's a really good level of depth. Then you go to the bench. You got you, you have to get him healthy, but we know what Galloway's impact can be. We know he can do a lot of different things for you. You've obviously got Luke Goody there as both a shooter and a, a player who, you know, can kind of offer some sort of lineup changes for you, some some matchup changes for you. Um, you've got Gabe Cups, who played more last season by Mike Woodson's own admission than expected, but now is a year older and he can be a bit of a steadying force at point guard. And you've got Bryson Tucker, who I think people have just kind of forgotten about. Like Indiana, Indiana signed a McDonald's All American um, last spring, and I feel like everyone's just sort of forgotten about it because of what sort of followed that in the transfer portal. My point is, you know. I, I can make you an argument. Indiana's got the most talented starting lineup in the league. Then Indiana's got the most talented top seven and the most talented top nine. Again, we don't know how it's all going to fit together, but I I sort of understand people who are bullish on this Indiana team, not least their head coach. Yeah. And I mean, when the the coach is saying, you know, that he's got so much talent, he doesn't know how it's all going to, you know, in terms of rotations, I, I think that was one of the things that he talks about that, um, you know, he's not sure, you know, the, the competition for playing time is going to be uh, uh, fierce kind of going throughout the season, and that's going to determine kind of his rotations. Uh, and so, you know, you talk about Bryson Tucker, um, he's going to have to certainly earn uh, minutes uh, and, and sort of win them against guys that, um, you know, maybe that have more experience than him. The other thing, I mean, listen, it, it, you know, I got a lot of when I talk to people outside the Indiana bubble, and I understand why a lot of questions about does Indiana still need one more shooter. I think that the counter to that is basically just where would that player play? I think that that really what Indiana needs is is one of these players to make a leap from a, a shooting perspective. You had McKenzie Ibaka, who shot close to 38% in Big Ten play. Last season, clearly kind of found a shot as the season went on. You need that to sustain. We know what Goody can do. He's a, close to a career 39% three-point shooter across, you know, three seasons at, at Illinois. I got a ton of volume last year and was basically about as accurate as, as, his, um, as his career percentage in general. What you need is someone like, you know, for example, Trey Galloway. If you can take some of the ball handling off his plate, obviously he's got to get healthy first then maybe you can get him back to maybe not at 47%, but back toward what he was shooting two years ago when you could sort of target his role a little bit more, particularly offensively, and not maybe burn as as much of his energy doing other stuff. Or a guy like Cannon Carlisle, who shoots 32% at Stanford last season. If 32 goes to 37, then there's there's your one more shooter. I understand why people look at Indiana, believe me, after all these years of Indiana not being able to shoot the ball very well. I understand why people look at Indiana and they're sort of skeptical of the idea Indiana's going to get better at shooting the ball until they see it. Um, but I do feel like, you know, it, it, I don't know that adding another shooter for shooter's sake was the solution here. What Indiana needs is, is one, maybe two players already on the roster to just be let's say four to five percent better from behind the three point line than there were a year ago. And suddenly that makes a pretty meaningful difference. Yeah. I don't, I don't know necessarily, like you said, it's going to come from just one guy in terms of, you know, if they can elevate everybody a little bit. I mean, you know, they've talked a lot about Malik Renew um, being more of a shooting uh, threat and kind of spacing the floor a little bit more. I think Woodson's mentioned that um, sort of both times he's talked to the media uh, over the last month, what was your take? Sort of, I think you kind of joked. <laughs> anytime Woodson was asked about a specific, like, are you going to do full court press? Are you going to do this? Are you going to do that? He's like, yeah, we're going to do that. Yeah, we're going to do that. Yeah, we're going to do that. What was your kind of, <laughs> what was your reaction to sort of the catch I mean, all? Because that, that is kind of what, that's what kind of got me down that road of just thinking about Indiana's roster. And, you know, because when we put the poll together, 
it sort of struck me, and, and I'm going back and, and looking at it right now. Um, Indiana is one of only two schools with multiple players, or excuse me, Indiana is one of only, I'm just kind of doing the math here, forgive me while we're talking. I think one of only three schools, maybe four schools with multiple players that, you know, kind of represented in this, maybe five. Indiana is the only school with four players. And, and that kind of, you know, that, that got me, I mean, like I'm not sort of saying somebody should have been in the first team or the second team and, and somehow Indiana's depth split votes. It, it's more a way of saying, um, you know, nobody, very few people in the conference were willing to throw their cap over the wall on the idea that Indiana was going to win the league. But it's kind of clear from looking at this this canvassing of of league media that Indiana, in the in the eyes of that media, probably has the deepest team, probably has you know sort of the the most aggregate talent. And then you hear about, or you hear from a coach just sort of saying, "Well, you know, we could do just about anything." You know, and, and you I think are right to compare where Mike Woodson was a year ago, talking about, "Well, we got a young team, we got guys that haven't played together very much." We got to figure out some roles and this and that. And it's not like he had every answer down pat on on Thursday. But I mean, it, it, what kind of led me down that that path of, you know, what if Indiana's even more talented than maybe we're giving it credit for, is that Woodson himself doesn't seem to be putting a ton of limitations on this team in the preseason. Now that doesn't mean he wasn't sitting there saying, "I can't wait to go to the Final Four, you know, see you all in April." But you have a coach. Wouldn't that have been a good media days if he just sat down and was like, "We'll do this." Yeah, we'll do this in April. In book, San book, your, book your flights, guys. Book your flights. I think I think it's in San Antonio, isn't it? I think it is. So we'll do this. You know, we'll do this at the Alamo in uh, in in six months. <laughs> but yeah, it um, the Alamo. yeah, it is at the Alamo, the actual Alamo. We're <laughs> this, we're really <laughs> leaning into uh, the San Antonio vibe this year. Um, no, I, I just I think it was sort of like, well, if this if Indiana's coach is not really putting a lot of limitations on his own evaluation of his team, then then you know maybe we shouldn't either. Um, and listen, for the record, I picked Indiana. I think third or fourth. I think the schedule's difficult. We talked about that 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 stretch in January and February. They play seven road games in, in eleven overall games. You know. Th- that kind of stretch just does not tend to be conducive to winning the league. Even if the overall strength of schedule number is a little bit more manageable, that's just a very, very difficult stretch. Um, now, the flip side is, you know, I'm, I'm looking at this on paper right now, and, you know, it, it starts with Rutgers, Penn State at the Blaster, USC at Iowa, then Illinois. Well, you know, guess what? Win those five games, and suddenly, you know, that 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 run of four road games and six looks a lot more forgiving so it it is a little bit sort of how it structures itself out too but my point is i say this as someone who did not vote indiana to win the league um and and you know i don't think i even had indiana second but i hear indiana's coach i hear other people talk about indiana and i just kind of wonder like maybe i'm undervaluing this maybe i'm selling this team a little too low i'm not sure so what did you pick up third fourth you're just not revealing I I or what, just don't remember let me see here. Hold on. What's that like last I week? I had third. I had I had Purdue first, Illinois second, and Indiana third. Was there anything you heard? I mean, was the schedule was your big takeaway? Anything heard you heard at Big Ten in terms of from any other coaches or anything that stood out? Well, I mean, yeah, I mean that 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 what I wrote off the kind of the unbalanced schedule, kind of the money quote was Tom Izzo. He said, like, is the is the is the team a champion or is the schedule a champion? And Listen, ever since the Big Ten went away from we have 10 teams and we play an 18-game league schedule, it's a total round robin. Um, You know, ever since we went to the unbalanced schedule, it has ever been thus that a, 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 um, a favorable strength of schedule has been part of the formula of winning the league. You know, I think in the last, like, 10 years, the average strength of schedule per Ken Pomeroy, I, I ran these numbers for that. I want to say the average strength of schedule for a conference champion, and I think there were 14 in the last 10 years, if you count years where it was shared. I think it was 11th. 
So, and, and that will, that number will always be a little bit artificially depressed by, um, by, you know, the fact that you can't play yourself. If you're the best team in the league and you can't play the best team in the league because you are the best team in the league, then, you know, everybody else is going to have in the sort of strength of schedule formula, a bit of a leg up on you because there's an input that they all have that you don't. Um, and again, like everyone's made peace with this a little bit, even before the 18 team league, the, you know, when you went back to those, that 18, when you, when you went back to the true big 10 and everybody played everybody twice, once home, once away, if memory serves you, the, the scheduling pairs even kind of acted as a little bit of a balance because that meant that like the teams that you were paired with were going to be playing the same teams you played around the same time as you played them a lot of the time. So it wasn't one of those things where, you know, if, if, if you wound up competing with one of your schedule pairs, your travel pairs, or whatever they called it, you know, for the league title, it wasn't like one of you played one team at the beginning of the year and they were a totally different team at the end of the year, at least not super consistently. This is the opposite extreme. You're going to play three teams twice and everybody else you're going to play once. And that's it. You know, that's the, that, that's the, that's the 20 game um, league schedule. And it was like, I mean, it was interesting to talk to Mick Cronin, who pointed out in the Big East, they used to have a no play. There used to be one Big East team that that uh, Cincinnati just wouldn't play at all every year. But listen, it's, you know, it, it it's kind of one of those things where. What was that? How was that determined? I don't rem- I mean, I didn't ask him. But remember, that old Big East was pretty top heavy. It was like 15 or 16 teams. Um, I just think it's gotten to a place where you kind of have to accept that, you know, the, the path to a, a conference title is out of your hands in a lot of ways because the, the schedule has just become so lopsided. And because again, if you know, Indiana is an example of, they don't even necessarily have maybe the most statistically difficult schedule, at least not right now. It's October 8th. We'll see what things change. But Indiana is a team that has a stretch in its schedule that is pretty ugly. And that is always going to be sort of a, a, a consideration when you ask, you know, can a team win a conference title? Can it not? Um, but the unbalanced schedule is, is the big piece of this. And I think it's I think it's in some ways it's even more unbalanced, not just in terms of who you play, but, you know, the rhythm of the games you play because the conference has to be able to accommodate, you know, okay, UCLA is going to be at Indiana on Friday, February 14th. Um, that's, uh, that, that is UCLA's, that's going to be UCLA's Indiana trip and it's Illinois trip. You know, UCLA is going to be home for three straight games and, and in a way four straight games, because they're going to play USC on the road on the 27th. Then between the 30th and the 8th, they'll play Oregon, Michigan State, and Penn State at home. But then UCLA is going to come out here and play because of the way the Big Ten structured this. They built it so that whenever the West Coast teams come east, they get two games in, not just one. Well, that means you're going to wind up with stretches. UCLA's got one there where they don't go on you know, the road really properly for about three weeks. After that seven road games and 11 stretch for Indiana, they, they'll get home you know, midnight, whatever, after midnight on February 12th, they won't play a road game again until March 1st. And so even like the rhythm of how you play games is disrupted by the fact that you've got to be able to accommodate scheduling and blocks a little bit more than you used to. Um, but I think more than ever, people are just going to have to accept that, like, you know, it's it's the schedule is a big component to how your season unfolds. Uh-oh. Mike Frost. Yeah, and that's fair. But, in, in you know, I didn't hear a lot of talk about sort of – pardon? So you froze for a second. You're What's back now. You, fr- you froze for a second. You're back now. Oh, you're freezing too. I don't, I don't know whose uh, internet is uh, clunky here. You keep blaming mine, but I don't know. Uh, it's yours. Yeah, I don't know. I I think coaches are kind of going to wait and see until, uh, you know, a year or two. You keep <laughs> interrupting. I don't know what what's going on. I didn't say anything. Now he's doing exercises. What are you doing? 
You're lagging really badly. So can you hear me now? I can hear you, but well, I think you're getting my me internet like doesn't say there's a... Am I lagging still? Now you're back. <laughs> this is good radio. Yeah, this is great. People are gonna love this. Um, let's talk briefly about the 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 women's team as well. I think probably fair to say still expected to be an NCAA tournament team, maybe not quite at the top end of the conference. Although again, when you look at some of the programs you're bringing in from the West coast, I know Oregon's had a couple down years, but they've been very good in the recent past. Obviously the star power of USC. Um, I, I thought it was interesting though, the extent to which it almost felt like Terry Moran was treated like, and she is, I understand why. But, you know, quietly, she's kind of become one of the deans of this conference's coaching, you know, sort of group. And if you look around, you know, she's been in that job longer than almost anybody else. Lisa Bluter obviously has moved on from Iowa. I know there are some that have been around longer, you know, Brenda Freeze, obviously some coming in. I think Corey Close has been at UCLA longer than, than Terry moran has been at IU. But the extent to which it's almost sort of like Indiana's kind of become part of the furniture as one of the programs that is expected to just kind of set the pace. And maybe they won't, maybe they'll win the league, maybe they won't, but you know, that people look at IU, IU women's basketball as established in a way that I think they've earned in a way that you really only can earn over several seasons. You can't, you can't just grab it off of one, two or three year stretch. Um, and it's just kind of interesting to me to, to, to see that difference as time has gone on of the Big Ten just kind of entrenching IU as as one of its sort of bellwether programs. Yeah, I mean, there was a lot of talk about kind of what they've established too at Assembly Hall in terms of um, the atmosphere and the environment, um, you know, for the women's side and not just the men's side. And so, um, you know, a lot of the new teams are sort of looking at that venue and sort of excited to play. And so it's become a, a very challenging, um, you know, I think what was one of the only five teams the average over, you know, 10,000 fans at home games last season. Um, so um, there was that part of it. And then, um, yeah, I think that this team has the talent to sort of compete again. I think it's going to be hard to topple USC. I mean, they seem like a, a certainly a juggernaut um, on paper with the roster. Um they have, but I think Indiana is going to be in the mix. Um, it's going to, you know, one of the things Terry talks a lot about is this team's going to look a lot different in terms of how the style of play. Um, uh, she did a lot of work in the off season and had her assistants do a lot of work, kind of scouting, um, not scouting, but just sort of watching film and sort of developing sort of a, um, a kind of a new look offense uh, without Mackenzie Holmes. Um, and you know, uh, it'll, it'll look a lot different. Is there a player in your mind that, and obviously we talked to Sydney Parrish and Chloe Moore McNeil, those were Indiana representatives of media day, but is there a player in your mind that is more important to that effort than Yarden Garzon? Because it just, it, it occurs to me that if you are going to try and be more multiple in the way you play and at times you are going to have maybe that anchor post, but at times you're going to play a little smaller or you're going to move around like, you know, who initiates who initiates the offense, who starts things with the ball in their hands. Indiana probably didn't have a more flexible player positionally than Yarden Garzon. And it just, you know, Terry Moore got some questions about her. She got some questions about a number of players. It just occurs to me like that's that's the sort of player that, to my mind, makes that work. When you're going away from someone who was, you know, just like kind of the alpha and the omega of your offense for so many years. And you're talking about being more multiple, being more versatile, the player that can fit it, their skill set into, um, into more, the player that can fit their skill set into more sort of, you know, can, can I guess fit the, the key into more different locks is the one that seems most important. Uh, it's weird. Yes and no. I think she has the highest ceiling on the team in terms of, you know, talent. Um, you know, I think she's one of the more naturally talented players uh, that you kind of, when you watch her, you just, she has a feel, an impressive feel uh, for the game. Um, but she has some limitations uh, defensively and um, foul trouble uh, has plagued her a lot, especially down the stretch last year. She just couldn't stay on the floor at times and, and kind of, 
Um, you know, I think struggled some with offensively uh, last year to find a rhythm. And so I think if she's sort of in sync and locking in, um, she could take this team to another level. But I also think that you're looking at, you know, um, Sarah Scalia, uh, you know, just what she did last year in terms of they leaned on her, I think, more offensively at times, almost than Mackenzie Holmes. Um, and she was just like deadly from three point range. And I think uh, the transfer they got from Penn State, uh, Shay Chesky, I think is how you say her last name. I believe uh, that's correct. Um, stepping in and giving them that volume and being that sort of that reliable threat where they could always get a shot, I think could have as much of a, you know, especially with the way they're going to play, um, I think could, could kind of rival that. But like I said, I think. If Yarden takes another step, she raises the ceiling of that that this team because she's so talented in what she can do. Like you said, her her versatility on both ends of the floor, the flat lineup flexibility she gives them. Um, but I think it's kind of a those two uh, will sort of define the season for them. We'll leave it there for now. Uh, we, we were going to keep it a little tighter today, um, but we will be back either at the end of this week or the beginning of next week. Obviously, spinning things forward. Uh, to IU football's big time showdown, uh, noon kickoff. Dare I say a big noon kickoff? We'll see. We'll see. I know you're still angling for game day. Alabama and Tennessee both lost last week. You never know. I'm guessing that game day is going to be in Austin, but you never know. If it's not, then I think big noon kickoff could be here in Bloomington, or if it is, rather, I think big noon kickoff could be here in Bloomington. We will obviously have a lot of buildup to IU Nebraska, but we were, we uh, are, we're going to take the bye week to set the table a little bit for basketball, both men's and women's. He is Mike Nislik. I'm Zach Osterman for the Herald Times and the Indianapolis Star. Thank you so much for listening. This has been Mind Your Banners for October 8th, 2024. We will talk to you soon.